Just, uh, just one critique. I just wish y'all could get a little more excited about it. <laughs> preach in all different kinds of churches, and uh, Brother Summer excited like y'all, some I think if I could ice skate, I could ice skate, <laughs> but uh, you, it's a breath of fresh air to come here and worship with you folks today. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22 is we're going to look into the Word today. Uh, God's doing some great things in the Northeast Florida Baptist Association. We're glad to have you all as part of us. And uh, without churches like you, uh, I could not do the ministry that, uh, that I do as an associational missionary. Um, people say, what, what did you do? And that's hard to answer. It's hard to answer that question. And Because uh, there's no one sentence and there's no one job description that fits an association of missionary or a director of missions as we call my title. I, I try to encourage pastors. I pastored for 27 years. And some of the most lonely, discouraged people I know are pastors. And they will get up, they'll hide it real well. But uh, just this week I prayed with a man who was crying on the phone with me and I said let's let's have prayer and uh, and this week I I had uh, by the way I didn't have three other pastors call so they could just speak today I said I'm looked at you today he kept saying to me when you come next time I want you to impart the word and I said well the best thing to do is get it on the calendar Amen. and I lock it in oh, and uh so again, I'm so grateful to be with you. You're so gracious, and I'm glad Jody and Hannah could accompany me today. Amen. They don't. Uh, they don't. We have a church membership in Spring Hill Baptist Church in Fernandina, and uh, I tell my pastor, I said I'm probably one of the worst members he's got, and uh, he says, No, you're in good standing as long as you tie them off. But my. My wife and my granddaughter are there quite often. But uh, today I want to speak to you from Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, if you're familiar with this passage, is a chapter of questions. There are several questions that are asked of our Lord. In fact, uh, I want to speak to you on this subject today. The, uh, the great question, the great commandment, and the great commission. Amen. And uh, this chapter, when you begin to read in Matthew 22, it's interesting all of the groups of people that existed during the time of Jesus that are just like groups of people that exist today. All right. In fact, I, I'm, I'm just by introduction, I'm going to get to our text in a minute, but when you go to verse 15, uh, the Pharisees began in Matthew 22 to take counsel how they might entrap Jesus. And then there was a group that came that were known as the Herodians. And these were folks that were loyal to King Herod. They thought, well, the, the, perhaps the solution to our problem is going to be the politicians. Now, we need to pray for our politicians, but folks, they don't have the solution. Only Jesus does. But the Herodians came to Jesus and said, uh, we have a question in verse 17. What do you think? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Yeah. All right, all right. Jesus said, look at your coin and whose picture is on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They said Caesar's. And he said, well, render to Caesar's that which is Caesar's, but render to God yeah. that which is God's. Yes. 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 <laughs> well, then they come to another group of people, the Sadducees. Now, these <laughs> folks intrigue me. And they asked Jesus a question about the resurrection. Now, you know why that intrigues me? Because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. All right, all right, all right. But they come and try to trick Jesus. And they said, Jesus, uh, we have a question. 
Now there were seven brethren in verse 25, and the first when he had married a wife deceased, and having no issue left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also to the third unto the seventh. Now if you know the Old Testament law, it was Jewish custom and Jewish law that if a man's if a man was married and he deceased, mm -hmm. the next brother would marry the woman, so she would not be widowed. Right. Yeah. Right. So they're combining some of the law that was truth, but they said, Jesus, we've got a question. She was married to the first brother, the second brother, the third brother, on out to the seventh, and this is our question. In the resurrection, who's she going to be married to? All right. All right. Now, if you wonder why Jesus had problems with religious folks, mm. He said in verse 20 time, 29, He said, you do err mm. not knowing the Scripture. Yeah. You're in error. You don't know the Scripture, nor do you know the power of God. Amen. For in the resurrection, neither do they marry, nor are given in marriage, but they are as the angels of God in heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there are a couple of other groups. There were the zealots. Mm -hmm. The zealots, they thought, well, we're going to take control by force. Mm -hmm. And then there was a group, there are probably several groups I'm not going to mention today, but there was a group known as the Essenes. We don't see them mentioned in Scripture. But I traveled to Israel several, I've been twice, and you're familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in Qumran. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Archaeologists believe that the Essenes put those scrolls there. That's right. And they were a group of Israelites that believed the kingdom of God would come. Uh -huh. And they believed, they believed they would be executed for their faith. So they hid the scripture there All right. that we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's interesting they tell me that John the Baptist, they think, was part of the Essenes, and he was looking for the kingdom of God, and one day he met the king. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. All right. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God yeah. taketh away the sins yeah. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So there were a lot of different folk. And then there were the Pharisees. Uh -huh. yeah. Now there were the folks that could do no wrong. <laughs> You know, I meet a lot of folks, they, they're looking for a perfect church, and I tell them, well, don't go join it. If you do, you're going to mess it up. <laughs> you're going to mess it up. There is no perfect church because churches are made up of people, and there are no perfect people. The only perfect person was Jesus. Yes, right. Amen. Amen. But the Pharisees, they're... they're they're just enjoying all of these questions and they want to catch Jesus. And mm -hmm. in verse 34 is where I want to pick up and read our text. And if you're able to, would you stand with me in reverence to God's Word Amen. and follow with me silently as I read our text aloud. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that He put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And then one of them, which was a lawyer, you're in trouble when you got a bunch of lawyers around, amen? But a lawyer in this day were men who studied the Scripture. And they asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Wow. Quite a question, isn't it? Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Jesus didn't flinch. He said, this is it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Let's join together in prayer. Father, Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your people gathered today. And now, Lord, I just pray You would anoint these lips of clay to impart a word from heaven. God, Your people came today not to hear what I had to say, but they came to hear 
the Word of God. A Word from Heaven. God bless your Word. If there are any here today that don't know Jesus and free pardon of sin, may today be the day of salvation. But for those of us that know you, draw us closer to you than ever before. Lord, may we leave this place different from whence we came. And we'll be careful to give you praise for all that's done in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. The Pharisees come to Jesus and they're trying to tempt him. And they come and they say, Master, we, we want to know something. And this is what we want to know. Which is the greatest commandment? You see, that's the great question. And you know, I suppose that was a legitimate question when you're dealing with Jews who focused on Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments. Now you got to remember, looking into this, these fellows were pretty sharp. But now they were dealing with the sharpest of the sharp. They there were Ten Commandments which exemplified to us the moral standard of God. By the way, can I tell you today, nobody's ever been saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. Amen. Amen. Come on, come on. Nobody, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm going to keep the commandments. I ask a lot of folk, what do you, uh, you know, uh, do you know for certain you have eternal life and you're going to go to heaven when you die? And they'll say, well, I think so. And I say, well, supposing you're standing at the gate of heaven right here and Jesus were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say to me? And you know, overwhelmingly the reply is, well, I've tried to be a good person and keep yeah. the commandments of God. The problem is all have sinned and come short yeah, of the right. glory of God. Yes, right. And the Ten Commandments were not given to us so that we would keep them to be saved, but that we would realize our sin and our need for the Savior. And you see, Old Testament Israel did not have Ten Commandments to keep, but they had 600 Levitical Commandments that they had to abide to. So they come to Jesus and they say, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, I do believe that he was focusing, and they were focusing primarily on Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments, because four of those commandments relate to God, and six of them relate to to man. In other words, how we relate to one another. And Jesus is going to summarize that. He is going to encapsulate those ten commandments into two. And basically he's going to say, if you can get these two right, you're not going to have any other trouble with the rest. All right. All right. The great question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? By the way, just in case you do think there are some folk, and I've met them, they say, well, I've never broken the law of God. Well, you get over into the New Testament and you begin to listen to the Lord Jesus, and He said, now, the law says you shall not kill. But I tell you, if you've been angry with a brother without just cause, you've committed murder in your heart already. And Jesus said, the law says, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you have looked upon a woman and lusted all upon right, her, right. or ladies, if you have looked upon a man and lusted after him, you have committed adultery already in your heart. What yes, Jesus has a way of blowing your ship out of the water. Yes. <laughs> and then James in the New Testament, James says in chapter 2, verse 10, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Oh, that's right. That's right. So we offend in one point? I may not have ever murdered anybody, but have I lusted? God says you've murdered. You've committed adultery. You've taken my name in vain. And the list goes on and on and on. The great question, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Well, that brings me to the second point of my message, the great commandment. And Jesus gives it. Notice what he says in verse 37. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, with all of thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Jesus summarized it this way, folks. 
He said, you need to love God and you need to love one another. Yeah. Oh, pastor, we could get that right. <clears throat> if we could just learn. Now, love God. What did he mean to say love God? To, to love God. He meant you need to have a personal relationship with God. Amen. There needs to be a time in your life when you realize that you are a sinner and you need a Savior and you Amen. repent of your sin and you call upon the Savior, the Lord Jesus, to come into your life and save you and make you complete. Amen. I think of the Apostle Paul who considered himself a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He said, I'm a Hebrew among the Hebrews. And what a bold statement. He said, if you looked at me as touching the law, you would have found me blameless. You couldn't have found any fault within me. But he goes on and he says, I was lost. And I was undone. And he gives this testimony there in the book of Philippians. And that same Apostle Paul under the leadership of the Spirit of God in the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 would say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin, the word sin is an interesting word. Now we could, if I said to you, now what's, what's sin? inevitably we begin to name some like that are mentioned in the commandments. But do you know the real word sin means simply to miss the mark? All right. All right. Remember Exodus 20, I told you the Ten Commandments of God were a moral standard of God. They weren't intended to save us. Now do we need to pay attention to the law of God? You better believe it. Our country, oh how we need the law of God. Oh Lord have mercy. But it reveals to us how depraved we are and how sinful we are. And, and Paul reminded us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. And in many evil times when an archer would put his arrow in his bow and he would aim at a target and he would release that arrow and the arrow would fall short, they tell me he would yell, Sin! Because he shot the mark. And he missed it. It fell short. And that's what sin really is. There's God and there's the moral standard of God. And we're trying to reach that moral standard of God. But every time we try to do it on our own, we miss. We sin. But Jesus came and left heaven. Hallelujah. Came to earth in human flesh. Yeah. He came and walked 33 and a half years and He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet He never sinned once. Yeah. You see, that, that there are people I was reading a, an opinion poll, pastor in the Florida Baptist Witness about Florida Baptist and, and uh, what did we think about certain things and I was proud that at least on the question did they believe that did, did Florida Baptist believe that Jesus was sinless? I think about 80% of us Believe that. I know it ought to be a hundred percent. But you know, you gotta figure you got twenty percent nuts where it go. You just gotta figure that into it. Now when you go out when you go out survey wise just out in the world, there are very few people that believe Jesus was sinless. Yes, that's true. But He was the sinless Son of God. Yeah, he was the Lamb of God. Yeah. All right. And if He was not, then we just might as well close up shop and go to the house today. Yeah. But you see, that's what's making, what made Him special. That's what makes Him special today is that He is a Savior who has been tempted in all points like as we are. You say, well, you mean Jesus was tempted in these commandments and... And, and now remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin when you succumb to the temptation. Jesus was 40 days and 40 nights out in the wilderness fasting. And you know the first thing that Satan said to him? Why don't you turn the stones to bread? You suppose he was hungry after 40 days? Man, I can't go four hours. He was 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil said, if you're who you say you are, you can just speak the word and turn the stones into bread. And Jesus said, but man doesn't live by food alone, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And time and time again, I know there are only three occurrences that are mentioned there in the temptation of our Lord Jesus, but it's my personal feeling is that He was tempted in every way because that's what the Hebrew writer says, right? 
every way that you're tempted, every way that I'm tempted, and yet He never, ever sinned. Because He was the Lamb of God. And the Lamb in the sacrificial system, when the Old Testament Jew would offer the Lamb, he would have to find a Lamb. They would put a Lamb up and they would look at it to make sure it was without spot or without blemish. And then only that Lamb without spot and without blemish could be used as a sacrifice. And it was only with the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. And Jesus, the sinless Son of God, went to the cross and shed His blood for you and for me. Jesus said, the greatest is this, you love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Have a relationship with me. And then I must move on. He said this, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I tell you what, you show me a church that's loving God and loving one another and their neighbor. You know. Now the question came up in the parable of the Samaritan. Who's my neighbor? All right. Well, my neighbor is anybody that I come in contact with. That's right. And I meet folks in despair down at the convenience store. I meet them in my associational office. And one of the things I tell people I do as a hobby, your pastor is a chaplain in the hospital, but I also am an endorsed law enforcement chaplain. And occasionally I go out and ride with the sheriff's office deputies in Nassau County. And we go into situations and I think, you know, and I've told people, people say, why do you, why do, you do that? One of the reasons I do that, Pastor, is it helps me get in touch with people that are lost. Amen. Right. And that it causes me to never lose sight mm, yeah. of how people are without That's Jesus. Right. That's right. Come on, yeah. come on. That's right. We go out on those calls and go into those homes of domestic dispute and domestic battery. And, and I could just go on and on and on. But the opportunities that God gives me to share the gospel in situations like that. And then, I want to tell you, do, I don't know if we have any law enforcement in here, but if you know law enforcement, I want to tell you, they can become some of the most cynical people. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, they can. You know why? Because they see everybody at their worst. Yes, now, we come to church, Pastor, and we hopefully see everybody at their best. <laughs> but you go out there on the road and you get out there in the world, and man, they encounter people at their worst. And I, I'll have a deputy say to me every now and then, hey, I, I'm just having a real struggle with this because I saw, I saw this, this little girl that was abused. And I can't imagine how someone would abuse a little child like this, but does God have an answer to something like that? You know what? God, that He tells us the depravity, the sinfulness of man. If we don't have a Savior, if we don't know Jesus, it's no telling how low you will go. And, and you know the problem with society today is that, let me give you a little principle to take home with you. The further away from God people get, the less value they have on human life. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Now, I grew up, and Pastor, I think I've got you beat by a little bit in years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, right? you know? <laughs> but I grew up in the middle of the Bible Belt. Now, we're, I don't know, Jacksonville, it, it's still kind of Bible Belt and kind of like Southeast Georgia. Now, you get south of Jacksonville, that's another story, but I, I grew up in eastern Kentucky, and I remember in elementary school, when, can you believe they let preachers come in and preach in schools? Mm -hmm. I'm talking, I started first grade, I think, in 1962. Mm -hmm. I was born in 55, and, and I remember preachers coming in. We'd have a back-to-school revival meeting. Mm -hmm. Or have a gymnasium, and the, the Baptist preacher would preach one day, the Presbyterian preacher would preach the next. The Methodist preacher would preach the next. And, 
And you know what? They were all preaching the same thing. Jesus. I don't even know if you could get those groups together today and get them to preach the same thing. I'm glad that I'd like to hope and think that all Baptists are preaching Jesus, but I don't know about all of the other groups. But then they came along and they said, no, you, you, you can't do that. And you know, we, we had terrible things back when I was in school. I, I remember having, I, I'd get caught for chewing gum and I'd have to write the word gum 500 times. Amen. 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 You know what I'm saying? Amen. Just a terrible crime. Yes. Chewing gum. Yes. Chewing gum. Yes. Chewing gum. Yes. Man, look at where we are today. Yes. But you see, when you take God yeah. away, yeah. I'm afraid, you know what I tell these young men, these, you know, these young ladies, you know the greatest mission field is the, the school system? Someday we as the church of Jesus Christ, the law says we can't go there, but some way we've got to penetrate it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there is a generation coming along that does not know God. That's right. That's right. They don't know God. And you know, have you ever thought about this? Christianity is one generation away from extinction. All it takes is for us to just be quiet for a while. And no one, no one will know of the gospel. But you see, our culture... It's just a reflection of what people feel about God. That's right. And, and I'm, Pastor, I'm praying, oh God, give us some people of conviction. Amen. I read where at Iowa State University, somebody went in, and I do this quite often. I go to conferences on college campuses, and it's nice because they have like a, a, a motel or hotel there, and you can do, go to your conference and stay there on the college campus. But Iowa State University had somebody go into their quarters there and they pulled the drawer open and there was a Gideon Bible. And they were an atheist so they began to complain. And Iowa State University said, oh, forgive us for that. We're sorry. We'll take every Bible out of the housing quarters and we'll move them to the library. And if someone wants to go to the library and check a Bible out, they can. And I wanted to say, where is somebody that will stand up and say, bless God, if you don't want to look at the Bible, close the drawer. And we're going to leave it there for somebody who might want to look at it. Now i got news for you. You think you're going to move God and try to please everybody? Go, go, go up to the president if you please everybody. Amen? Ask any elected official if you can please everybody. Ask any pastor, can you please everybody? Yeah, come on, come on. Yeah. You've got to worry about pleasing Jesus. So he said, what's the greatest commandment? Love God and love one another. And you see, folks, we've got to get back to loving one another. The agape love of God. There's several words for love in the Scripture. And uh, uh, in fact, in the Greek language, there's several words for love. There we have the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia is the Greek word, and we have the city Philadelphia. Well, they need some brotherly love up in Philadelphia, amen. 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 And and uh, uh, there 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 is eros love, erotic love, which the Greeks used to describe a love relationship between a man and a wife. And they tell me that when they were trying to describe the love of God, they didn't have a word they felt was sufficient. So they actually invented a word, and it's the word agape. Yes. Agape love. An unconditional, God-given love. I, I remember a story old Dr. Lindsay. When I say old, I, I mean that respectful. He's in heaven now, but he was a mentor of mine that pastored the... First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. And he was very, very transparent, if you ever knew Dr. Lindsay. Now, he wasn't very talkative, kind of extroverted, or introverted, really. In fact, if you talk to him, he'd tell you. He, he'd tell you, Pastor, I really don't like people. <laughs> he said, I just assume they leave me alone. All right, all right. But he said, I go out because Jesus tells me to go out, and I tell them God loves them, and Jesus died for them. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And I want to tell you, I've never known a greater soul winner and a greater example than Pastor Dr. Homer Lindsay Jr. But he was sharing one day, he said there, there was this fellow in the church. We pastors could identify with this. And Dr. Lindsay said, listen, that guy could come in the building and my spirit would be quenched. He said, I'd lose my relationship, my right walk with God just looking at that man. He said, God got to deal with my heart. God said, pray for him. So Dr. Lindsay said, I began to pray for him. And I noticed as he was walking in the building, I, I didn't have that same feeling that I had. All right, all right. And his conclusion was, he said, you know, it's hard to hate a man and pray for him at the same Amen. time. Amen. All right, all right. Hard to dislike a man or woman and pray for him all at the same time. Right. You see... We've got to love God, but then to learn to allow the agape love of God to help us reach out to others. You say, well, you don't know what that person did to me. I, I don't like them. Well, you know, God likes them. Yeah. <laughs> we can do about that. Yeah. And you know what? He doesn't say that I have to like them. He says I've got to love them. And I've got to love them with agape love. Yeah. And that's an unconditional love that only God can give me. Well, you're not listening fast enough, so I'm going to move on to my third point and I'll be done. <laughs> We've talked about the great question, the great commandment. Now I want to talk about the great commission. Amen. Now we'll never do the great commission until we learn to love God and love others. Amen. And the great commission is given in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. It says, Go ye into all the world and teach the gospel to all creatures. Preach the gospel to all creatures, teaching and admonishing them, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of this age. He reiterates it again in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the country, part of the world. But you see, folks, we're, we as a church get hung up. Loving God and loving others. And some of us won't go across the street to tell our neighbor Amen. the good news of Jesus. I tell you what, you think about it. And you know the principle in the book of Acts, Pastor, is each one reach one. If we let, think out, just look around here today. If you left and between now and next Sunday, you reach one. One person. And, and you know, Barna, or not Barna, Rayner, Tom Rayner says that about 75% of the unchurched people said they'd go to church if somebody would asked them. That's a shocking thing. We, we just, we automatically get tuned out and we think, well, hey, our neighbor's not into this and our neighbor, you know, they, they, and hey, they might live like hell on earth. But you ask them to come to hear about Jesus, you might be surprised their response. Because they don't have hope. They don't have hope. Jesus said, there's somewhere, something I want you to know, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. There's somewhere I want you to go, and that's as you go, beginning where you are with your next door neighbor, and as you go, some of us, we may go into way other parts of the world. God has allowed me to travel to South America and travel to the Middle East and travel to Southeast Asia, and you know what I find wherever I go? Man's got the same problem. He's empty. He's a sinner that needs salvation. And, and he needs Jesus. So it don't matter where you go. But begin, Jesus said, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem. That's What does that mean? I had, I had a Baptist deacon ask me one day, Pastor, I just don't understand. How are we going to be a witness to Jerusalem? And, and I appreciated his sincerity. I said, now he's using that metaphorically to us. He was speaking it literally to those Jews in Jerusalem. You begin in Jerusalem. For us, it's beginning where you live. 
Unity, it's beginning in your community. That's right. Your Jerusalem and Judea would take you to, to perhaps your association. Your county of Duval and Nassau County. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. That would take us to the United States all across the U.S. And I tell you, I've, I've done some ministry in some wild places in the United States. I've seen some beautiful places. I tell you, if I could, I'd live in Wyoming and Montana, but I'd have to go by myself because my wife wouldn't go with me. <laughs> she says, I don't like cold weather. And I mean to tell you, this is a winter day for her. <laughs> but, but, you know, all the... I, I, I'm a native Appalachian person. So last August, I spent four days touring West Virginia. Now, you you got to kind of you got to know those folks' language. And I told them, I, I critiqued them, and I said, one problem you got here is you're bringing folks in that aren't native to Appalachian. You're trying to get them to minister to these folks. And you got to understand, when you go, you got to meet people where they are. If you go to the Appalachian Mountains, they're going to be half of the gospel, half superstition, Lord have mercy, don't go to church on Sunday morning and have a crow fly across your path or a black cat walk across your path. They'll say that's an omen telling you ought, you ought, to, ought to do something else. And they've got these guys from Louisiana and Texas up there and they're looking at me like I've got three heads and I'm telling you, you've got to meet these people where they are. Amen. You, got to, you just got to plug in where they are and tell them the truth. Tell them there is no such thing like superstition. Yeah. But you, I mean, you got to get that across to them. You yeah. can't just tell yeah. them that on the spot. Yeah. You got to tell them God's in control. That's right. God yeah. is my sovereign. Right. Jesus is the creator. Right. And He controls all things. Yes, yeah. So wherever you go, wherever you go as you go, share the good news of Jesus. Go, reach, teach, win, baptize, and disciple. All right. All right. Well, Master, which is the greatest commandment? Well, he told them. He summarized the ten into two. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't throw the ten out. He just said, but if you can get the first four encapsulated in the fact that you're to love God, and the last six encapsulated in the fact that you're to relate to man and love man, you're not going to have any problem with the rest. I like what it says in the last verse, verse 46 of this chapter. And no man was able to answer him a word, neither did any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Amen. I quit asking questions too. He put the Herodians in their spot. He put the Sadducees in their place. And he put the Pharisees where they needed to be. And through it all, he was saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, the good news is you can. If you know Him, the good news is you can grow closer to Him in an intimate relationship. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer and turn the service over to the pastor. And he can conclude as he feels me. And Father, thank You for Your people. Thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. It's been so easy. Your folks have been so attentive. And it's been easy, Lord, because your spirit has communicated through these lips of clay. God, I don't know what you wanted to say to all folks that are gathered here today. As, as many people as we have, we have as many different needs. But I just pray that you would speak and give strength to men, women, boys, and girls that might need to make a decision of whatever sort it might be. In Jesus' name we pray and for His sake. Amen. 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 God bless you. preacher said being good just not being good enough he said you must have a safe so the question today is 
Are you good? Or are you saved? And if you are saved, are you sharing your Savior with the dying Lord? You may be here today and you say, you know, I had this thing all messed up. I'm good. I, I, I don't commit any sins. I do everything I'm supposed to do. But you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. All right. If that's you today, the doors of the church are open. Come and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's kind of like having a new car. It's a good car. But if you don't have no gas, it's right. oh, oh, useless. Okay. And some of us are good, we, we, but we don't have the Holy Spirit. We don't, we don't have the power to make us go. And without power, you're useless in the kingdom of God. So if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you're not filled with this Holy Spirit, let me implore you to come. Then there's another person that you say that you believe in Jesus Christ and you have accepted him, but and not connected to a local body of Christ, a body of baptized believers that you can you can come work in the kingdom. Let unity be your home today. Let this be the place where Paul says you work out your salvation. Amen. Come join a baptized group of baptized believers that's working in the community. We, we're working in our Jerusalem. Serving as the servant serves us. As either this is you, the doors of the church are open. Come. Let's give God a praise for this man. 